as Amir's mother, I'm about to do my job. And I reiterated to him that I was not disappointed. I was disgusted with the decision. A family's anger, confusion, and pain. Tonight, Minnesota prosecutors announced they will not file charges against a Minneapolis police officer who shot and killed a black man during an early morning no-knock warrant. We speak with Amir Locke's mother, who says she will never give up on her search for justice. Dark discoveries as Ukraine regains ground once held by Russian troops. The scope of destruction becomes more clear. In one community, skeletons of buildings and Russian mines littering the area. President Biden now calling the massacre in Bucha major war crimes as the U.S. and European allies team up for another round of sanctions against Russia, including Vladimir Putin's adult daughters. ABC News Live is on the ground for the latest in this war. James Longman reporting from Ukraine and our Martha Raditz in Washington. Adventurers with a purpose to bring answers to families who live with painful questions. It was so painful, but it was almost like a relief. Tonight, how so-called YouTube sleuths are solving decades-long cases, working all on their own. Student loan repayments on pause again. Six extensions, but no promise from President Biden to cancel the more than $1.5 trillion in debt. So what happens when the next extension runs out? We sit down with the Secretary of Education to learn more. It's a slice of science inspired by home cooking during the pandemic. A chef and a scientist came together to perfect the pizza so you can bake your best pie ever in your own kitchen. What I'm taking away is that you're really actually trying to empower people sure. to make their best pizza. The most important thing that the objective of this book is for people who love pizza to have a deeper understanding of it, to learn ways of making it better, uh, to basically I guess you could say perfecting it. Good evening, I'm Stephanie Ramos in for Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Nothing less happening than major war crimes. We begin tonight with those words from President Biden as Russia is pulling out of some Ukrainian towns and the world is getting a horrific picture of what is happening there. President Biden was talking today about the images in Bucha, just outside Ukraine. Bodies dumped into mass graves, civilians executed in cold blood. And tonight we are getting a look at what's left of the town of Bordianka from above. And our team is seeing it on the ground for themselves as well. Russian forces held that town longer than Bucha, and officials there fear what they left behind may be even worse. Biden today announcing more sanctions against Russia following the authorization of 100 million more dollars in military assistance including a new small drone. More in a moment on how that could help Ukraine. But first, James Longman reports on the devastation he saw with his own eyes today in Bordyanka and how the world is responding. Tonight, as Ukraine reclaims more towns outside Kyiv, even darker discoveries of what the invaders left behind. As we push north, everywhere we go, we've got to go very slowly because the Russians mind the whole of northern Ukraine, basically, and so you just don't know what's out there. We reach Borodyanka, and the scale of destruction here is like nothing we've yet seen. Somehow, the devastation is even worse. I mean, take a look at this. Businesses, homes, just completely destroyed all the way down this road. You can see that apartment building there. Look, people's homes just chopped in half. Apartment blocks ripped in two, virtually no building untouched. 14 bodies were recovered here today, but the likelihood is far more are buried under the rubble. This man heard the bombs landing around him. The man is telling us we're not going to go in because we, we just don't know, you know, there could be mines in this place, but this, this man's home just has holes all over the roof. Look. Nadia stands outside her decimated home. She watched from her apartment as Russian jets dropped bombs on her town. The only thought I had was, I wish it would happen instantly. I don't want them to dig us out of the rubble, she says. But there are no emotions anymore. There's nothing left. The other thing about this town is that all you really hear is the sound of crows. There are very few people because there's nothing for them to come back to. Mounting outrage over these atrocities prompted President Biden to impose new sanctions today. Civilians executed in cold blood 
bodies dumped into mass graves, a sense of brutality and inhumanity left for all the world to see unapologetically. There's nothing less happening than major war crimes. The U.S. is banning all new investments in Russia, penalizing the country's largest banks, and even sanctioning two of Putin's adult daughters. U.S. officials suspect many of his assets are hidden with family members. Vladimir Putin's daughter Maria is a medical academic in Russia. Ekaterina is head of a research institute at Moscow State University. People across Ukraine know U.S. weapons have made a difference here. Shoulder-fired javelin missiles taking out countless Russian tanks. The U.S. has now promised $100 million worth more of the weapons. Happens. The Justice Department also confirmed U.S. prosecutors are working with counterparts in Europe to investigate potential Russian war crimes. There'll be much work to do. The mayor of Mariupol says more than 5,000 people have been killed since the invasion began, over 200 of them children. Officials in the city report witnesses have seen evidence of Russians operating mobile incineration units to burn the bodies of dead civilians potentially trying to cover up evidence of war crimes. Claims of the mobile crematoria couldn't be independently verified by ABC News, but the mayor of Mariupol is now calling his city a new Auschwitz. More than a thousand people who are able to escape the hell of Mariupol on their own were met by the Red Cross in a nearby city, and they were led to relative safety in a convoy of buses and private cars. And in Borodjanka, a message for Russia. Moscow says that this isn't happening, that... Russia's not doing this, that they're not killing people. Do you have a message for Vladimir Putin? Let Putin come here and look at Borodyanka, Nadia says. I have no future anymore. A terrible tragedy unfolding there, and it is not yet over. James Longman joins us now from Kyiv. James, it is just so devastating there, and, and the U.N. is holding a vote tomorrow on Russia's place on the U.N. Human Rights Council. What's expected there? Yes, definitely. I mean, I think a lot of people will be home, at home will be shocked to discover that Russia is still on the UN Human Rights Council. Tomorrow there'll be a General Assembly vote to have it removed. The United States ambassador there has said she expects to get the two-thirds majority needed. Uh, I've got to tell you, after what we saw today, uh, it doesn't seem to me that Russia has any place on that council. Uh, Borodyanka is almost entirely destroyed in, in the centre of town. And the great tragedy there is that over the coming days and weeks, we're very likely to see more and more people pulled from the rubble. A great many people in that town took shelter underneath their buildings. Of course, we saw so many buildings destroyed, and so they're likely trapped underneath. And that is what we're going to see over the, the next month, I think, here. It is so, so heartbreaking to see those images. Incredible reporting. James, thank you so much. Please be safe. The United States is taking additional steps to arm Ukraine, sending $100 million for Javelin missiles. The U.S. is also sending small yet lethal switchblade drones to Ukraine, and training is already underway. Here's Chief Global Affairs anchor Martha Raditz. Tonight, more than 100 of these exploding drones on the way to Ukraine, with more to follow. The switchblade drones are small enough to be carried in a backpack and launched from anywhere. Unlike long-range drones like the Predator, which fires its missiles and returns to base, the switchblade drones are the missiles, packed with explosives and some able to fly up to 25 miles away. This kamikaze-like drone is launched from a tube, its operator guiding it toward a target and then slamming the drone into it, some able to pierce armor or blast holes in a tank. The switchblade also has a wave-off feature so that if the human operator spots civilians in the area as they guide the drone, they can abort the attack. Small but mighty drones. Martha Raddatz joins us now from Washington. Martha, the U.S. military has been training Ukrainian soldiers to use those drones right here in the States. Uh, they have, Stephanie. These drones do require training, but there are Ukrainians already in the U.S. on a foreign military exchange program so they can go back to Ukraine and operate those drones or train others. And this is exactly the kind of equipment, plus those javelins and stingers, that the administration believes will really make a difference. Stephanie? The U.S. doing what they can to help. Martha Raddatz, Force in Washington. Thanks so much. Good to see you, Martha. You too.
Next, state prosecutors in Minnesota announced today they will not file charges against a Minneapolis police officer who fatally shot Amir Locke while executing a no-knock warrant in February. The officer fired just seconds after the SWAT team went inside. Prosecutors said Locke was holding a gun when he was killed. We're standing by to talk to Amir's mother, but first, Alex Perez reports from Minneapolis. Tonight, prosecutors say no criminal charges will be filed against the Minneapolis SWAT team officer who shot and killed a 22-year-old Amir Locke during this early morning no-knock raid. You don't want to put anybody on trial for a case simply to meet um, public demand. It has to be a it has to be a, a ethical consideration based on prosecutorial ethics. Authorities say police body camera video shows Locke raised his handgun in Officer Mark Hanneman's direction moments before Hanneman shot him. Although his finger was not on the trigger, um, that gun was pointed directly at Officer Hanneman. That portion of the video has not yet been released. The ordeal unfolding in less than 10 seconds. A police body camera video shows officers using a key to quietly enter the apartment, then announcing themselves. Locke on the couch at his cousin's apartment under a blanket appears to be woken up by the commotion when he's seen with a gun in hand. Hanneman fires three shots. The warrant related to a separate murder case. Locke was not a suspect, nor was he named in the warrant. His family says he legally owned his gun. His heartbroken mother tonight outraged. The officer who killed him won't be charged. The spirit of my baby is going to hunt you for the rest of your life. Wow. Hmm. I am not disappointed. I am disgusted with the city of Minneapolis. Yeah, Stephanie, prosecutors did express today sympathy to the Locke family, but they say the officer acted lawfully and any charges simply would not hold in court. The mayor here, by the way, has instituted a permanent ban on no-knock warrants. That becomes effective on Friday. Stephanie? For more now, let's bring in Amir Locke's mother, Karen Wells, and the family attorney, Ben Crump. Thank you so much for joining us. Karen, let's start with you. Minnesota Attorney General Keith Ellison spoke with you before the state made the announcement today that they wouldn't press any charges against that officer that shot your son. Tell us, how did that conversation go? Well, he basically explained to us that they were not going to bring charges uh, against the police officer. I listened to him. I responded back and I told him now that he's done his job as Amir's mother, I'm about to do my job. And I reiterated to him that I was not disappointed. I was disgusted with the decision. And Karen, first and foremost, we want to express our sincere condolences for the loss of your son. I can, can't even imagine that pain. But Karen, you've vowed to keep fighting this decision. You want no-knock warrants banned in Minnesota in the name of your son. What is your message for public officials in the state tonight who have a say in making that happen? I believe that no matter what party line you're on or no matter if your seat is up for re-election, that my son was a human being. He was also a resident of the Twin Cities. He was born and raised in Minnesota. And I feel that in order for us to all across the party lines, we need to come together and realize that no-knock warrants are not good for the police officers. They're not good for my son. They're not good for anybody else because in the end, it doesn't do anything. It, it brings uh, harm. It brings uh, death, which is what happened with my son. So, you know, right now, I believe that no-knock warrants should be banned across the state of, of Minnesota, and it should be brought in the name of my son, Amir Locke. And a policy so many have been fighting for so long. Mr. Crump, uh, again, thank you so much for joining us. And, and it's good to see you, unfortunately, under these circumstances again. But from a legal standpoint, A.G. Ellison says there was insufficient evidence to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the officer violated any legal elements governing when police can use deadly force. Do you believe the A.G. worked in good faith and the laws currently on the books ultimately prevented him from bringing charges here? 
Well, I want to believe that he did everything he can do. As Karen and Andre, the parents of Emil, said, they did their job, what they thought they had to do. Now we're going to do what we feel we have to do to try to expose the hypocrisy and the injustice of these no-not warrants that are disproportionately executed against African Americans as if we don't have a right to the Fourth Amendment. And then, once you bust in our doors in the wee hours of the morning, you don't expect us to have a right to the Second Amendment either. They said it was a life or death situation. Was well, a life or death situation created by the police, created by bad policy. We shouldn't have this no not warrant law because it is foreseeable that it's going to be a danger to the police or it's going to be a danger to innocent citizens like Karen and Andre's baby boy. And Mr. Crump, I understand you want the Justice Department to review this case. Do you think they will? Well, I think they will because not only the specific instances of this case, but they need to review the pattern and practice of this uh, signing no-not warrants. Is it disproportionately against African Americans. We saw after Breonna Taylor was killed in Louisville, Kentucky, and they looked at who these deadly no-not warrants were being executed against, and they found, Stephanie, that 82 percent of the time they were knocking in African American doors. They were not doing this to our white brothers and sisters. And so until we can have it where it is done equally, and justly, then the Department of Justice needs to review everything that Minneapolis has done in executing these warrants. And we'll be watching to see if they do. Now, Karen, before you go, we know that in the past you've said that uh, Amir was ha had a, a legal uh, permit to carry a weapon because he wanted to defend himself in a city that has seen so much crime in the last couple of years. But before you go, tell us about Amir, who he was and what he cared about. Amir was, had a beautiful spirit. He had a beautiful smile. He was my baby boy. Uh, Amir, at, at the age of 22, wanted to be a, going, you know, like follow entrepreneurship. So he did DoorDash, um, he did Instacart, and then he also, I helped him uh, get his LLC. He started his own business, and he was really focused on, um, he was already musically inclined because of his father, so they had a natural talent. And he was just ready to go into like real estate, music, saving the youth. He was really big on that. I mean, he really talked about wanting to start a clothing line that catered to the, the youth and then working with my relatives as well in my hometown state. So we were really looking forward to reuniting back with each other and making plans to start doing the things and reaching the goals that Amir wanted to do. And he was a beautiful, spirited person. I, if you can interview over 50 people, 50 people would say that they loved him and they wouldn't have anything bad to say about him. He was a, he was a beautiful soul. Karen, thank you so much for, for sharing that. Thank you so much for your time. And uh, we wish you all the best. And again, our sincerest condolences to you and your family. And Mr. Crump, thank you so much for joining us as well. Be well, guys. Thank you. Thank you. We turn now to the pandemic as an FDA panel met today on whether a second booster shot is needed for everyone. No decision was made today, so when will Americans have more guidance? Here's ABC's Eva Pilgrim. Tonight, with COVID infections climbing again, a panel of FDA experts today weighing whether a second booster shot is needed for all Americans. We need to continue to focus on the worst case, which is severe disease. I think it's safe to assume that for most people, a booster is in their future. The big question is when and what vaccine will be offered. It comes just days after the CDC greenlighted a second booster for Americans over 50. Dr. Rochelle Walensky says the people who need that shot now might need another booster before the winter. We really would encourage people who are over 50 who have underlying medical conditions, those over the age of 65, to go ahead and get that next shot. And also to recognize that they may very well need another shot come the fall. But vaccine officials today warned time is running 
holding out if the government plans a broader booster campaign in September. There's some urgency to decide which variants should be the target of future vaccines. And that likely has to happen by May if we have a chance of doing a clinical trial that ultimately gets an authorized booster ahead of the surge in the fall. Already looking toward the fall. Eva Pilgrim joins me now. Eva, how soon could we learn if a second booster will be recommended more broadly? Well, the FDA's vaccine chief said that that expert panel will meet again as early as May to make a decision about another round of boosters this fall. Stephanie? All right, we will be watching. Thanks so much, Eva. Now to the deadly tornado outbreak in the south. At least one person is dead in Texas and another in Georgia. 49 tornadoes reported across five states. In Ellabel, Georgia, a suspected tornado ripping buildings apart and sending debris flying everywhere. Senior national correspondent Steve Osinsami is in Atlanta, where tornado watches are in effect across Georgia and the south tonight. The tornado watches will keep millions up tonight across the south. And in rural South Georgia this evening, there was already this tornado. That's the sign for the Sumter County line blowing in the wind. After a deadly 24 hours of severe weather, the governor of Georgia has declared a state of emergency. They're afraid of more of this west of Savannah on Tuesday when drivers had to pull off of Interstate 16. That tornado's at least a mile wide right now. Since the week began, authorities report more than four dozen tornadoes across five states. Look at that. This one tore through a golf course and took the roof off of a building. And south of Macon, that sound they always hear before seeing a tornado. All of a sudden, sound like a freight train and then all this stuff hitting the house. One person was killed in Georgia. Georgia's governor saw some of the damage himself. We're blessed that it wasn't a prolonged on the ground event, but where it did hit, it is complete devastation. So much damage there. Thanks to Steve for that report. When we come back, the investigation underway after a boat was crushed by a drawbridge. And the moratorium on student loan payments has now been extended through the end of August. But is that far enough with so many facing crushing debt? We'll speak with the Secretary of Education coming up. But up next, the group of so-called internet sleuths cracking decades-long cold cases. The remarkable story coming up next. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast, now streaming on ABC News Live. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. We have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pat. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. The hottest views in daytime are happening right here. We talk about things on this show that people don't talk about. That I can't wait to see. Honest takes from strong women. We need all hands on deck and we need it right now. This is the time to speak out. Unafraid to get real. We stick by our points of view. We're all seeing it differently and that's the beauty of The View. And that's why the most watched number one daytime talk show is The View. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Is that the gun? That's not the gun. What is it? I won't ask you again, then. Are you a Nazi? <laughs> the deeper you go into the black market, the darker it gets. Why hasn't anyone come out and spoken? It's about the money. That's all we do. Trafficked. New episodes Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. 
Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Take a look at this close call for a group of South Florida boaters after their pontoon boat was crushed by a drawbridge. It happened in Jupiter, Florida, and some on board the boat jumped into the water because they were scared they could be crushed, understandably. That incident is under investigation. And next to a new phenomenon, civilian divers cracking cold cases for free. They're called adventurers with purpose, and they have become pretty popular on social media. But for families who have all but given up on finding their loved ones, this team is also a last hope of sorts. Bob Woodruff has more. There's a hint of magic in this family. To the outside world, baby Oakley hasn't a single care, wrapped up in the loving arms of mom and dad. But for Desiree Carpenter, the love she shares with little Oakley is an opportunity to give her baby girl something she never had herself. I never grew up with a mother, so I didn't have that to go off of. I try to give her that relationship uh, with her mom that I will never have with mine. On a warm, windy evening in September, 23 years ago, Desiree's mother, 19-year-old Samantha Hopper, dropped off then four-year-old Desiree at her grandmother Debbie's house before driving off with her two-year-old daughter, Courtney. I'd sit on my front porch watching the road. She never come back. <laughs> Samantha disappeared without a trace. Despite a lengthy police investigation that went on for two decades, there were no signs of her or her young daughter, Courtney, vanished and missing for more than 23 years. I filled out so many missing person reports that every time you do that, you have to give them a picture. And I don't have no pictures left. Despite the pain, despite the anguish, Samantha's case, tragically, is anything but unique. Every year, more than 600,000 people go missing in the United States. It's been called the nation's silent mass disaster, a trend that presents an alarming reality for families and law enforcement. I lost hope. I just got to a place where I was like, there's no way she's alive. She just can't be alive. And I think when I had my daughter, that sealed it for me. I was like, there's no way. There's no scenario where I could see walking away from my daughter. It almost hurt more to think that she could be alive. While her hope may have been fleeting, her determination was not. Unable to get anything concrete from law enforcement, Desiree's search for answers took her to an unlikely place. YouTube. Let's just kind of start at the very beginning. And a group of guys with a boat, some sonar, some diving gear, and a willingness to search in places where others could not. I had a friend, she was in a Facebook group with me. Somebody had posted that there was a diver coming. My friend saw it, tagged me in it, telling me, you need to get in contact with these people and um, see, you know, if they can help you. They are adventures with purpose, a team of volunteer divers scouring the country looking for missing persons cold cases. Jared Lysick and Doug Bishop are not law enforcement, but a couple friends coming from humble beginnings. So I started uh, a YouTube series called Adventures with Purpose in July of 2018. 
And that was, you know, just simply getting in the water, showing what was out of sight, out of mind, picking up pop cans, bottles. When did you make that shift from trying to clean something off the bottom of the, of, of the lake to somehow trying to find all sorts of pieces of evidence from previous cases and find human bodies? It became a calling, you know, when a family reached out to me in the fall of uh, 2019. They had seen these videos that we were putting up on YouTube as finding vehicles and pulling them out of the water. And they reached out and they said, you know, we have a lost loved one here in Warrenton, Missouri. We believe that he's in the water. We have a cell phone ping at this boat ramp. Can you come help us? Because nobody else is helping us. With so many families feeling like there is nobody to help, Jared and Doug are filling a critical need, going where police and investigators rarely have the tools, technology, and skills to go. What's the percentage of success on this? When you start searching, how often do you get the results that you want? For the cases that we take on, between 15 and 18% is what we're currently solving. So we have a 20, 18% chance today that we'll find. For law enforcement, I'm, I'm sure that the statistics are close to a half of a half of a percent of them solving a cold case. Their adventures so far are making an impact. They say they've already solved 20 cold cases and in the process have become social media sensations with more than 2 million subscribers on YouTube racking up more than 200 million views. Today on these ponds and lakes in central Georgia, they're trying to find answers about a missing father whose family says has vanished without a trace and hasn't been seen for months. Their work is in many ways a double-edged sword, a delicate balance between offering up hope and sobering truth. Failure means another day of no answers for these grieving families. Success means confirmation of their greatest fears. People call you up, the family, they contact you when they almost know for sure that they will not be found alive. That's a tough one, you know. Normally they're reaching out to us because they have had a friend or a family member that has seen our show on YouTube or Facebook, and we don't charge them a dime for our time. Same thing with law enforcement. We don't send them a bill for what we do either. We're right there side by side with them. On this day, they would not find that slim chance of success. Not every family gets an answer to their questions. Not every story has an ending. Sometimes they will go years without a sliver of truth to go off of. But sometimes in those slimmest of chances and those most wishful of hopes, they find an answer. Jacob has a vehicle underwater. Mm -hmm. uh, we do not know what this vehicle is until we dive on it. So I just want to err and caution, yeah, you know, please remain optimistic, but in, until I get into until the water, get in the water yes, we don't, we don't know. know. In October, 23 years and one month after she went missing, Jared and his team found Samantha and Courtney. Her car sitting in less than 10 feet of water, just a few miles from her home, ever since that fateful September night. For me, when I went up on the bridge and spoke with the detective uh, who is over my mom's case, in that moment, talking to him right there next to that wrecker and him pulling her purse out of the car and showing it to me, I was like, OK, this is it. I don't have to deny it anymore. I don't have to tell myself that it's not her to make it feel better. It's her. It was so painful, but it was almost like a relief. It was like a relief that she didn't let me. She didn't leave me. She would have never left me. People spend their lives searching for purpose, for meaning, for an aim to our lives that makes sense. But sometimes purpose isn't found in the things we do for ourselves, but the moments we give to others that makes all the difference. I don't have peace yet. People keep telling me, at least I have closure. I don't feel like I have closure. I have a hundred more questions than I had yesterday. What I do have now is I have a place where I can take my daughter one day and I can take her to visit my mom and my sister. And I think for me, over time, I hope that I can learn to be okay with this. Wow, that team's work appreciated by so many families, especially the Hopper family. 
Our thanks to Bob for that report. Still ahead here on Prime, new details in that deadly mass shooting in Sacramento. Police now believe nearly half a dozen shooters were involved. We'll explain. The shocking claim from authorities that what they found during one drug bust could have killed more people than the number of people that live in the entire city of Los Angeles. And Tiger Woods makes his return to Augusta. We take a look at his latest attempt for another green jacket by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day. Some shade courtesy of Tampa Bay Airport. Justin Bieber and his wife there. The deeper you go into black markets, the darker it gets. Traffic Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos, the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. Is that the gun? That's not the gun. What is it? I won't ask you again, then. Are you an IT? <laughs> the deeper you go into the black markets, you could be putting your life at risk. The darker it gets. Why hasn't anyone come out and spoken? It's about the money, that's all we do. Trafficked. New episodes Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. These days, with so much going on, it's hard to keep up. While others are recapping yesterday's headlines, we're bringing you the right now. This is the busy border crossing. Steel barricades, another strike. The right now look at the day ahead, how it affects you and your family. Record high gas prices. The threat of cyber warfare. Is peace possible? World News Now beginning at 2 a.m. Eastern, followed by America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. Streaming here on ABC News Live. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. I risked my life. If I was caught, they would have put a bullet in my head. That would have been one of the most deadly acts of domestic terrorism ever in the United States. He put himself in jeopardy for us. Tiger Woods is set to make his return to the PGA Tour tomorrow at the Masters at Augusta National Golf Club. Let's take a look at his remarkable comeback by the numbers. It's been just over 13 months since Woods survived a devastating car crash that left him with severe leg injuries requiring multiple surgeries and unclear if he would walk, much less ever play professional golf again. The 46-year-old had played his last tour event in 2020 at the Masters, where he finished tied for 38th place before undergoing the fifth back surgery of his career. But against all odds, Woods will now make his return with his 24th start at the Masters, a tournament that has defined his illustrious career. He first won there in 1997 at just 21 years old by a record 12 strokes, which still stands as the largest margin of victory in the tournament's history. He went on to win three more times through the early 2000s before his career was derailed by scandal and injury. But he returned to glory with his 2019 Masters win at age 43, his first major championship in 11 years, and his fifth overall win at the Masters. Woods has won 15 majors total in his career, putting him just behind Jack Nicklaus in his record 18 major championships. A record Woods hopes to get closer to with another win this weekend. And we still have a lot to get to here on Prime. The decision about whether or not to file charges in a horrific duck boat accident. And 
the new technology aimed at stopping cheating in Major League Baseball. But first, a look at our top trending stories on ABCNews.com. Stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues. The hunt. True crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. National parks are incredibly safe places, but crime will happen. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I know what happened and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. New brutal images coming out of Ukraine. The Ukrainian governor of the Donetsk region releasing these new photos, which he says show an attack on a school. Ukrainian officials say the building was acting as a humanitarian aid center. And in Bucha, the British Ministry of Defense confirming bodies of Ukrainian civilians were on the ground for at least 10 days before Russian troops who controlled the area left the city. A sign of support from the Pope kissing a Ukrainian flag from Bucha. The UN now says close to 1,500 Ukrainian civilians have been killed, with almost 2,200 others wounded. The White House will levy new sanctions against Russia that will further isolate the Russian economy, making it more difficult for Russian President Vladimir Putin to fund his war. Russia wanted to take Ukraine's capital city, Kiev, and topple its democracy and elected government. Today, Kiev still stands, and that government still presides. This fight is far from over. With inflation at the highest level in 40 years, the cost of food could go up. The USDA expecting grocery prices to increase between 3 and 4% this year. Meat, already up 14% from a year ago, could go up another 4%. Eggs, up more than 11%, could rise another 3.5%. But food from restaurants expected to rise the most, between 5.5 and 6.5%. And to tame inflation, more signs tonight that the Federal Reserve could raise interest rates as much as a half percent when they meet next month. New warnings about the spreading threat of illegal fentanyl. Over the last few months, law enforcement has seized enough of it to give every single American a deadly dose. The fake pills are made to look like Xanax, Oxycontin, or Percocet, but instead they're laced with fentanyl, which is 80 to 100 times stronger than morphine. In response, the CDC is raising awareness about tools that can help addicts, including treatment, fentanyl test strips, and Narcan, which can reverse the effects of an overdose. And deaths from overdoses hitting Americans of all ages and across all demographics. 
In California, new details about the mass shooting in Sacramento that killed six people and injured a dozen others. Police in Sacramento say they now believe there were at least five shooters and that there might have been more. They're still working to figure out where all of the over 100 bullets came from, and they're increasingly confident it was a gang shootout, even though innocent bystanders may have been struck. Over 200 photos and videos have been submitted to police as evidence. It was one of the deadliest boat accidents in U.S. history. 17 people killed. And now, nearly four years later, all 63 charges filed by state prosecutors, including first-degree involuntary manslaughter, have been dropped against the boat's captain and two other employees. You can see the boat struggling to navigate as waves hit from every direction on Table Rock Lake near Branson in July of 2018. Winds reportedly more than 60 miles per hour. The boat capsizing tossed 31 people, including several children, into the water. Prosecutors argued the three employees were negligent in allowing the boat to enter the water despite several weather warnings. The judge says he doesn't believe the employees were reckless, that they knew about stormy weather but weren't aware of high winds. Major League Baseball going high tech in the effort to stop sign stealing. Electronic devices for pitchers and catchers to communicate calls, an effort to both speed up the game and prevent opposing teams from stealing signs. The device called Pitchcom works with a flexible receiver inside the pitcher's hat. The catcher uses this keypad on their wrist to send the pitch call and location to the pitcher's ear. Creators John Hankins and Craig Filicetti both use similar technology during magic shows. They were inspired to build the devices for baseball after the Houston Astros elaborate sign stealing scandal rocked the league following their 2017 World Series win. The Houston Astros are world champions! We pivot to some big news for a lot of Americans. President Biden's announcement that he will extend the pause on student loan repayments once again, this time through August. This delay marks the sixth extension of the program in the two years of the pandemic. And currently, there are 43 million Americans who owe a combined $1.6 trillion in student loan debt. Joining us now to take a deeper dive into all of this is Secretary of Education Miguel Cardona. Secretary Terry, thanks so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. While I, I don't think many people are going to complain about the extension, <laughs> in the president's statement today, he said, if loan payments were to resume on schedule in May, analysis of recent data from the Federal Reserve suggests that millions of student loan borrowers would face significant economic hardship and delinquencies and defaults could threaten Americans' financial stability. Now, what exactly is the Federal Reserve looking at when deciding whether or not to resume these payments? Well, you know, the Federal Reserve has, has their data points on uh, what, what the financial conditions are of people. But I can tell you from my conversations with Americans across the country, they're still struggling. You know, we as a country are moving in the right direction with uh, you know, the economy, there were 7.9 million jobs uh, this past year, which is a record number. Um, so we're moving in the right direction. However, uh, Americans are still hurting. You know, they're paying their mortgages now. People are going back to work and uh, childcare needs are, are coming up again. So we recognize that um, this loan pause uh, for another three to four months is gonna give them an opportunity to get them, get their legs under them again. And we wanna make sure that then when they come back on, that they have the supports that they need to make sure that they can do it successfully. We want our students to be successful. A student loan is something that looms over so many of us. Is there a no. chance that this could go beyond August? It could be extended again. Yeah, that's a good question. And, you know, it's really important, as you said at the beginning of the of the interview, that, you know, this is based on, on, on numbers. This is based on data. We want to make sure we're listening and we're responsive to Americans and their needs. And we recognize that um, while we have a date of August 31st, we're going to put that data out there. We want to make sure we're supporting our borrowers as they come back on. We also want to be very clear that we're continuing to monitor this. You know, I anticipate um, continued improvement across the country um, because the conversations we're having today are so different than a year ago. We were talking about vaccines, about a quarantining a year ago. And we want to put this in perspective. 
Elon Musk, you heard of him, right? <laughs> so he was just named the world's top billionaire. He is worth $219 billion. It would take nearly eight of him with his fortune to pay this debt off. Hopefully my math is right there. But many Democrats are calling on the president to forgive all of the debt. Is this an option your department is seriously considering with the president? You know, we are continuing those conversations about broader uh, debt relief. Uh, but it's really important for the listeners to hear, we haven't stopped. Since day one, we're trying to fix the root of the problem. You know, college affordability is an issue. Um, but also, loan forgiveness that should be happening wasn't happening. We had a 98% denial rate for public servants who qualified for loan forgiveness uh, when I became Secretary of Education. 98% of our teachers, our, our nurses, our doctors were being denied loan forgiveness. Today, loan forgiveness exists for those who have uh, been in the public service fields, our veterans, our, our service folks, you know, they have loan forgiveness eligible, uh, available to them if they've done public service for over 10 years and they've been paid, uh, paying into their loans. We've also forgiven uh, loans for those who have total and permanent disability, for those who have been taken advantage of by their institutions, who have been selling them a bill of goods and never delivering on it. So we've done a lot. And you mentioned the root of the problem, college affordability. I have young yeah. kids. I am kind of, we're getting ready for the next, you know, seven to eight years, what college is going to look like. How are you guys? tackling college affordability and making it more affordable for, for young kids. That's really kind of what I'm really proud of what we're doing here at the Department of Education. It's not enough to say we're going to provide loan forgiveness and then not address the root of the issue. And then five years from now, we're in the same spot. College has become out of reach for too many people. That's the bottom line. We recognize parents right now are making decisions about whether or not they can talk to their children about college. That's unacceptable. That's un-American. We got to fix that. We're working on making sure the return on investment in college is better than it ever has been. And Secretary, quickly before you go, are options like a fixed lower interest rate being considered at all? We're, we're considering everything. Um, and what we're doing is we're listening to our borrowers. We're trying to make sure that we're fixing the system that's so complicated and, and difficult for borrowers to understand or very easy for borrowers to be misled. We're fixing those issues and trying to keep the borrowers at the center of the conversation. Right now, so many people are making profits off uh, borrowers. We're trying to fix that. We're calling out uh, bad actors in this process and forgiving loans where we need to because they were taking advantage of students. And any chance we can to uh, to improve loan uh, options for, for our borrowers and make it simple, we're doing that. And we have much more to announce. We're working really hard on this. It's important to us. It's important to the president. It certainly is important to all Americans as well. Mm -hmm. Secretary Cardona, thank you so much for joining us. We look forward to having you back on here. Uh, let's see, maybe in August when uh, we start talking about this once again. <laughs> Thanks again. Thank you very much. Two years into the global pandemic, it is safe to say pizza has proven once again its power to please as America's favorite food. Sales have soared. I know my family has certainly contributed to those profits, but so has the drive to perfect pizza making at home. Tonight, our Devin Dwyer has a closer look at what some are calling a new Bible of pizza and the unlikely duo of chef and scientists behind it. The secrets of pizza perfection, 12,000 pies in the making. We didn't eat 12,000 pizzas, but believe me, there was a lot of pizza eaten during that time. Chef Francisco Magoya teaming up with ex-Microsoft tech executive Nathan Mervold to create a 1,700-page guide to one of the world's most popular foods. We are unapologetic about loving pizza, and part of that says, hey, you can make a very traditional one, but if you want to step out a little bit on the wild side and try some stuff that might seem crazy, you might find you like it. Their ambitious project dubbed Modernist Pizza played out in this high-tech kitchen laboratory outside Seattle, where chefs and scientists tested pizza techniques in 500 experiments over three years. This 3D scanner, essentially what it does is it allows us to measure volume very accurately. What we learned from this is really, truly how ingredients interact with each other, how they affect each other. This gives you a more precise reading than your tongue. Oh, for sure, absolutely. From the texture of the dough to the tanginess of the tomato sauce. So these are your grocery store tomatoes the that you- The hardest we could find. The, the, the okay, hardest- those are usually pretty unripe. tasteless. Yes, so. Okay, wow. 
It's just it That's is unbelievable. It's like the ripest summer Salty, tomato. tangy. Super flavorful. I'm gonna take this home yeah. and keep eating it. I mean, it's like you can eat it just like that. It really is that good. The team even finding new yeah, uses for day-old leftover slices. We took a pizza and we freeze-dried an entire pizza that we baked. So this, there's absolutely no moisture in this pizza. Uh, you could eat it if you wanted to. It would be like a cracker. A problem with some dishes that are viewed as traditional is they stop evolving and they stop Im improving. And I think that's a terrible mistake. People said, you know, I could improve it. I could improve it here, I could improve it there. And that continuous improvement is what brings you things that are just fantastically delicious. At 35 pounds and 1,000 recipes, Mervold and Magoya's passion project has been dubbed the Pizza Bible. Pretty much, I think everything you need to know about pizza is in here, at least should be. What I'm taking away is that you're really actually trying to empower people sure. to make their best pizza. The most important thing that the objective of this book is for people who love pizza to have a deeper understanding of it, to learn ways of making it better, uh, to basically, I guess you could say perfecting it. We got a taste for ourselves from the chewy traditional Neapolitan. This is the original pizza. This is where all other pizzas come from. To modernist pies on the cutting edge. So you can hear how crispy you can hear the, crunch. the crust is. This pizza, a take on ham and pea soup with an experimental delicacy extracted from ordinary frozen green peas. And that's what we call pea butter. Pea and, butter. Yeah, but you know, there's no fat in peas. The truly perfect pizza, Magoya says, may be all in the eye of the beholder. Truffles are more than flavor, it's aroma. But after trying slices at 250 pizzerias worldwide, he has a handle on the good. What makes Detroit Pizza Detroit is first the pan that it's baked in, which is this, it, these were pans that were used in the automotive industry. And the not so good. I will say that the worst pizza I had was a pizza that had bananas on top. It's bananas, pizza cheese, and tomato sauce. And oh, that it's awful. as bad as you think it is, maybe worse. How do you think the pandemic's changed mm -hmm. pizza making? When people started staying at home, they wanted to do all these projects, whether it was sourdough or you know knitting or what have you. Pizza was part of that as well. But it's also changed in the way that you know restaurants had to pivot. Restaurants that may not have been serving pizza, pizza is a great food for making ahead of time, putting in a box, and you know sending away. The data shows Americans devoured pizza mm -hmm. during COVID. I mean, what does that tell you? I mean, it's a food that is very close to our heart, and not just Americans, but the world over. There's only I think two countries where you can't find pizza. Pizza has found a home in almost every country on the planet, so there's a reason for that. So whether it's take home or try it yourself, pizza perfection now perhaps more achievable than ever. I'm going to have to check that out. My son definitely prepare, prefers store-bought, but who knows, maybe these guys can teach me a little something. Well, before we go tonight, the image of the day, one of the greatest to ever play the game, taking another swing at greatness. Tiger Woods tees on the 18th hole during a practice round for the Masters Golf Tournament in Augusta, Georgia. There he is. We broke down his comeback by the numbers just a few minutes ago, but as for what happens next on the green, we're just gonna have to wait and see. The game of golf certainly loves Tiger. That's our show for this hour. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks for streaming with us. in the next hour more on those new sanctions against Russia but will they be enough to stop some of the horrific actions happening during the conflict there in Ukraine and oil execs testify on Capitol Hill what they had to say about those sky-high gas prices America's number one news ABC News most watched most trusted and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. More Americans choose ABC News, America's number one news source.
Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. The deeper you go into black markets, the darker it gets. Traffic, Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. He thought he was God. He's now one of the most vilified men in the world. He is the everyman. Zelensky is the Tom Hanks of Ukraine. The fact that a little nice Jewish boy is 5'7 is showing up this KGB agent in the Kremlin. What do you say to Americans who see Russia and you not only as a rival, but an unfriendly adversary? Two men at war. Which Vladimir will take over? The world is not going to be the same. Christopher Steele, the guy who picked a fight with two presidents, and he's lived to tell the tale. That now infamous dossier. Supposedly a tape showing prostitutes hired by Donald Trump urinating on a bed. It would be quite a tape if it in fact existed. I said take out the PP tape. It quickly became a question of how much of this was accurate. This is the stuff of movies. A lot of this is the stuff of movies. <laughs> Story of epic proportions. Phony stuff. It's a bunch of crap. It changed history. I'm Stephanie Ramos in for Lindsay Davis. Thanks for streaming with us. We're monitoring several developments here at ABC News. A panel of FDA experts today advised that most Americans will need a second COVID booster. Vaccine officials discussed efforts to develop an improved shot to tackle current and future variants. However, they warned that production must begin soon to have enough supply for a significant booster campaign in September. Separately, the CDC said today that those over 50 who are getting their second boosters now would likely require a third in the fall. And oil executives defended themselves against accusations of price gouging before Congress today. Members of a House Energy and Commerce subcommittee grilled the companies on why gasoline prices remain high even after crude oil prices have dropped. They also questioned the company's priorities as they continue to enjoy high prof profits while motorists feel the pain at the pump. The oil execs claim the markets set fuel prices, not the company and many argued increased supply would be necessary to stabilize the market. Six state attorneys general put the NFL on notice today. Protect female employees or face a potential investigation. In a letter obtained by ABC News, the attorneys general from New York, Illinois, Minnesota, Massachusetts, Oregon, and Washington cite a New York Times article in which more than 30 female employees described, quote, a workplace culture that is overtly hostile to women. The NFL issued a statement in response saying, we have made great strides over the years but acknowledge that we like many organizations have more work to do now to the latest horror revealed in ukraine after those scenes of tragedy in bucha just outside ukraine with bodies dumped in mass graves civilians executed in cold blood tonight we're getting a look at what's left of the town of bordianka russian forces held that town longer than bucha and officials there fear what they left behind may be even worse james longman reports on the devastation he saw there today and how the world is responding Tonight, as Ukraine reclaims more towns outside Kyiv, even darker discoveries of what the invaders left behind. As we push north, everywhere we go, we've got to go very slowly because the Russians mined the whole of northern Ukraine, basically, and so you just don't know what's out there. We reach Borodyanka, and the scale of destruction here is like nothing we've yet seen. Somehow, the devastation is even worse. I mean, take a look at this. Businesses, homes just completely destroyed all the way down this road. You can see that apartment building there. Look, people's homes just chopped in half. Apartment blocks ripped in two. Virtually no building untouched. 14 bodies were recovered here today, but the likelihood is far more are buried under the rubble. This man heard the bombs landing around him. The man is telling us we're not going to go in because we, we just don't know. You know, there could be mines in this place, but this, this man's home just has holes all over the roof. Look. Nadia stands outside her decimated home. She watched from her apartment as Russian jets dropped bombs on her town. 
The only thought I had was, I wish it would happen instantly. I don't want them to dig us out of the rubble, she says. But there are no emotions anymore. There's nothing left. The other thing about this town is that all you really hear is the sound of crows. There are very few people because there's nothing for them to come back to. Mounting outrage over these atrocities prompted President Biden to impose new sanctions today. Civilians executed with cold blood, bodies dumped into mass graves, a sense of brutality and inhumanity left for all the world to see unapologetically. There's nothing less happening than major war crimes. The U.S. is banning all new investments in Russia, penalizing the country's largest banks and even sanctioning two of Putin's adult daughters. U.S. officials suspect many of his assets are hidden with family members. Vladimir Putin's daughter Maria is a medical academic in Russia. Ekaterina is head of a research institute at Moscow State University. People across Ukraine know U.S. weapons have made a difference here. Shoulder-fired javelin missiles taking out countless Russian tanks. The U.S. has now promised $100 million worth more of the weapons. The Justice Department also confirmed U.S. prosecutors are working with counterparts in Europe to investigate potential Russian war crimes. There'll be much work to do. The mayor of Mariupol says more than 5,000 people have been killed since the invasion began, over 200 of them children. Officials in the city report witnesses have seen evidence of Russians operating mobile incineration units to burn the bodies of dead civilians potentially trying to cover up evidence of war crimes. Claims of the mobile crematoria couldn't be independently verified by ABC News, but the mayor of Mariupol is now calling his city a new Auschwitz. More than a thousand people who are able to escape the hell of Mariupol on their own were met by the Red Cross in a nearby city, and they were led to relative safety in a convoy of buses and private cars. And in Borodjanka, a message for Russia. Moscow says that this isn't happening, that Russia's not doing this, that they're not killing people. Do you have a message for Vladimir Putin? Let Putin come here and look at Borodyanka, Nadia says. I have no future anymore. Our thanks to James there on the ground for us in Ukraine. The United States isn't alone in taking more aggressive actions against Russia. The European Union is considering some major steps that have others sounding the alarm about the impact it can have on their citizens. ABC's Ines de la Quatera has the details for us. Ines. Hey, Stephanie. Yeah, so the European Union is now proposing to ban Russian coal, and that's significant because it's the first time the EU is targeting Russian energy. But the bloc is also under growing pressure to ban Russian gas and oil, and that's something a number of EU countries are reluctant to do because they are so dependent on Russian energy. So roughly 40 percent of the EU's gas supply comes from Russia, about 25 percent of its oil. And so you do have some countries like Austria that worry that banning all Russian energy imports could lead to a recession. Austria opposing sanctions on Russian gas and oil, and Austria's finance minister arguing that such sanctions would hurt Austrians more than they would hurt the Russians. But that, of course, has Ukrainian President Zelensky furious. He is furious with the fact that it's taking the EU so long to ban Russian gas and oil. He's even accusing some Western leaders of considering that financial losses are worse than war crimes. The needle does seem to be moving a little bit though. So today, EU Commission President Ursula von der Leyen did say that this fifth round of sanctions would not be the last, that now that they've targeted Russian coal, they would be looking at targeting oil. EU Council President Charles Michel said that uh, measures on oil and even gas would be needed at some point. And in the meantime, individual EU countries are banning Russian energy on their own. So Lithuania over the weekend becoming the first EU country to fully ban Russian natural Natural gas and Poland saying it'll ban Russian oil by the end of the year. Both Poland and Lithuania calling on the EU to follow suit. Stephanie? Inez, thank you. For more now, let's bring in the former ambassador to NATO, Doug Loot. Mr. Loot, thank you so much for your time tonight. We've seen the horrific images coming out of Ukraine. And today, President Biden announced a new round of sanctions coming after authorizing $100 million more in weapons to Ukraine. In your opinion, which lane is more important to help end this war, more sanctions or more weapons? Well, the sanctions are not going to stop this war. The sanctions are designed to impose a cost on the Putin regime and on the Russian state. 
uh, but we won't be able in any time soon to amass sanctions sufficient to actually cause this war to end. The war is going to be won on the ground and in the air in Ukraine. Uh, and therefore, the most important form of support is to continue, as the administration announced, with this extra $100 million of support, continue to support them with the military means that Ukraine needs to combat the Russian invasion. That's where the war is going to be won. So, so hard to watch. It's incredible that it's gone on for this long. Now, NATO has stayed relatively united throughout this war, and NATO ministers even met today in Brussels. But now, weeks into this conflict, there are some cracks that are starting to show, especially as countries weigh their dependence on Russian oil and trade. How would you rate NATO's cooperation so far, and, and why is it so important to keep this uni unified front? Well, I'd rate NATO's solidarity as historically good right now. Uh, I think uh, the alliance has done a great job. It has marshaled the sorts of military assistance to Ukraine that Ukraine has used effectively on the ground uh, so far. Uh, it has contributed to the humanitarian assistance effort, now over 4 million uh, Ukrainian refugees. And it has, most importantly, stayed together politically and spoken as one. You know, it's not easy to get a, any group of 30, and here you have the 30 NATO allies, uh, to uh, come to consensus and stay together in the face of a war on NATO's doorstep. But, you know, there's more to be done. It is pretty remarkable that these countries have, have stayed together. I'm glad that you said that. It's, it's very impressive. But if this conflict does drag on for years, how tenable is it to keep sanctions against Russia when so many European countries rely on their oil? Well, look, uh, the European Union arguably uh, has a problem here. It's, it's stuck on a dilemma. And the dilemma is that um, their reliance on a very unreliable source of energy, so not only um, oil, but natural gas and coal as well. Um, now, the European Union has taken some initial steps that suggest that perhaps by the end of the year, they'll reduce their reliance on Russian natural gas and so forth. But, but look, there are no quick fixes here. You can't, you can't reverse 30 years of energy dependence on Russia in 30 days or 30 weeks. You've worked so closely with NATO for years. In your opinion, will there ever be a time or an opportunity for Ukraine to be a part of NATO? Well, look, um, actually, the, the NATO treaty itself uh, has holds the answer to your question. And, and, and what the treaty says in Article 10, and this is, of course, a treaty that was agreed originally all the way back in 1949, is that any European state that aspires to be a member of the alliance um, is eligible if it meets certain criteria. Uh, the challenge right now is that Ukraine does not meet those criteria. And the, the criteria that's most uh, problematic today for Ukraine is the political criteria that all the current members of the alliance, so the current 30 members, the 30 NATO allies, must all agree on Ukrainian membership so that things can change. And certainly the Ukrainian people, the Ukrainian nation, are proving that they can depend themselves. And that membership to NATO is something, of course, that Russian President Vladimir Putin is trying to prevent. Ambassador Doug Lute, thank you so much for your time tonight. We appreciate it. Next, state prosecutors in Minnesota announced today they will not file charges against a Minneapolis police officer who fatally shot Amir Locke while executing a no-knock warrant in February. The officer fired just seconds after the SWAT team went inside. Prosecutors said Locke was holding a gun when he was killed. Alex Perez reports from Minneapolis. Tonight, prosecutors say no criminal charges will be filed against the Minneapolis SWAT team officer who shot and killed a 22-year-old Amir Locke during this early morning no-knock raid. You don't want to put anybody on trial for a case simply to meet um, public demand. It has to be a it has to be a, a ethical consideration based on prosecutorial ethics. Authorities say police body camera video shows Locke raised his handgun in Officer Mark Hanneman's direction moments before Hanneman shot him. Although his finger was not on the trigger, um, that gun was pointed directly at 
Officer Hanneman. That portion of the video has not yet been released. The ordeal unfolding in less than 10 seconds. A police body camera video shows officers using a key to quietly enter the apartment, then announcing themselves. Locke on the couch at his cousin's apartment under a blanket appears to be woken up by the commotion when he's seen with a gun in hand. Hanneman fires three shots. The warrant related to a separate murder case. Locke was not a suspect, nor was he named in the warrant. His family says he legally owned his gun. His heartbroken mother tonight outraged the officer who killed him won't be charged. The spirit of my baby is going to hunt you for the rest of your life. Wow. Hmm. I am not disappointed. I am disgusted with the city of Minneapolis. The family of Amir Locke now want the Justice Department to review that case. Our thanks to Alex for that report. And still to come, the harsh crackdown against gang members in one country. And our conversation with the former Prime Minister of Australia about what to do about the increasingly adversarial relationship the United States has with China. That's up next. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pat. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. Hey, my mom. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. We're tracking several headlines around the world. In Afghanistan, a grenade attack on Kabul's largest mosque wounded at least six people as they knelt for afternoon prayer. The reason for the attack is still unclear and no one has claimed responsibility, but this is the second grenade attack there in less than a week. Meanwhile, the ruling Taliban announced a ban on harvesting opium poppies just as the harvest started in some parts of the country. Observers warn the order is likely to further impoverish farmers at a time when the country is in an economic freefall. The president of El Salvador announced plans to build a new maximum security prison for 20,000 gang mem members. He also threatened to stop providing food for imprisoned members of street gangs. He made the remarks at an army graduation ceremony. He has already ordered food for jailed gang members reduced to two meals per day, seized mattresses of inmates, and posted video of prisoners being frog marched through corridors. And an American nun working as a missionary in Burkina Faso has reportedly been kidnapped. The Archdiocese of New Orleans said the sister was abducted by armed men overnight. A State Department spokesperson tells ABC News they are aware of reports of a U.S. citizen missing in Burkina Faso. And the U.S. Embassy there is working, quote, dil diligently with local authorities. She is 83 years old and has been stationed in Burkina Faso since 2014.
The chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Mark Milley, has warned that Ukraine's war with Russia could go on for years. But even greater conflicts could be on the horizon as world powers battle for dominance on the ground and in the air. Chief Global Affairs anchor Martha Raddatz has that story. The U.S. announcing that it will join forces with the U.K. and Australia to develop hypersonic weapons and measures to counter them. These highly maneuverable missiles reach altitudes up to 300,000 feet and are nearly impossible to detect, much less defend against. Advances by China and Russia, despite tactical failures on the ground in Ukraine, have deeply concerned the U.S., Russia claiming to have used its own hypersonic missile in combat in Ukraine, and China reportedly launching one last year that flew around the world and fired a projectile while traveling more than five times the speed of sound. The U.S. spent 20 years fighting counterinsurgencies in Iraq and Afghanistan, while China and Russia were spending money on these kinds of weapons that would enable great power competition. The U.S. is well behind but trying to catch up. The U.S. confirming that that it has conducted testing recently, but the Pentagon did not want to announce it at the time, fearing it would only increase tensions with Russia as the world's attention focuses on the deadly conflict in Ukraine. A conflict that America's top general is now warning Congress may not be the last. We are entering a world that is becoming more unstable and the potential for significant international conflict between great powers is increasing. Our thanks to Martha for that report. For a closer look at the geopolitical tensions at this volatile moment in history, I'm joined now by former Australian Prime Minister Kevin Rudd. He's currently the president and CEO of the Asia Society, and he is out with a new book called The Avoidable War, The Dangers of a Catastrophic Conflict Between the U.S. and Xi Jinping's China. Prime Minister Rudd, thank you so much for joining us this evening, and thank you so much for my very own copy of, of this book. Pleasure to see you. So your book lays out the dangers of a future military conflict between the U.S. and China. Kind of break that down for us and, and why you think that could actually happen at some point. Well, Stephanie, when we look at the war unfolding in Ukraine, um, we had thought that we'd seen the last of war at this scale back in 1945. I think it's a sober reminder for all of us that war is never completely beyond the realm of possibility, even involving great powers. But two big things have happened between China and the United States. One is that China's become so much more powerful in the last 20 years, so that the balance of power militarily, economically, technologically is much closer than it used to be. And as a result, China therefore believes it has more capacity to assert itself against American interests and values in the world. Secondly, Xi Jinping, the leader, I talk about him a lot in this book and what his worldview is. Uh, he himself is on a trajectory to make China into the world's dominant power by mid-century and the dominant regional power probably in the next 15 years or so in the Asia Pacific. So that tends to put the US and China, I won't say on a collision course, but something getting close to it. So the book is about how can we navigate through this strategic competition without blowing each other's brains out? <laughs> uh, and you make the case in your book that the US and China should, should come to the table and agree on red lines. It, do you think that would work? I don't think there is a silver bullet here which somehow removes entirely all risk of crisis, conflict and war. What I'm about is reducing the risk to something more manageable. You see, right now we're in a period of acute strategic competition, militarily, economically, technologically, between, frankly, both countries and their partners and allies around the world. But at present, this strategic competition has virtually no rules of the road, no guardrails. What this book is about is an entirely realist book. It's not an idealist book which says, if only we could talk more and sit in the corner and have a kumbaya moment, it will all be over by tomorrow, Saturday morning, or something like that. It's not about that. It's just saying, what are some rules of the road here? So we don't have accidental crisis, conflict and war. About strategic red lines, which I think are capable of being negotiated, if not agreed, 
then non-lethal competition for the rest of the US-China relationship in the economy and other domains, and then finally still some space for strategic collaboration, like on climate change, which is in the interests of people in both countries. So a managed strategic competition could possibly reduce that risk. So let's say if, if such guardrails aren't put in place, just how likely do you think there, there could be a miscalculation or escalation to conflict between the two nations, let's say, in the next decade? Very high um, and gets higher as you get into uh, the 2030s. Uh, the number one scenario relates to Taiwan because China is determined to regain national sovereignty over Taiwan. Um, and that, of course, uh, for the United States and China, therefore, constitutes a strategic red line. In the South China Sea, we've got all these Chinese uh, claims for uh, maritime uh, domain. Uh, you have uh, so much metal rolling around at the moment. Ships, planes, vessels of all descriptions. The statistical probability of a crash, a collision occurring, gets greater and greater as each year goes by. And what you know is that when you have an incident, the capacity to escalate and have a crisis and have a conflict and even a war uh, increases as well, if not eliminated. And of course, the world's attention right now is on Ukraine and Russia. And we know that China is watching this conflict very closely. But China has walked that fine line of standing by Russia without directly aiding them in the war. What do you think is driving Jinping's calculations during this conflict? Well, the Chinese are run by a Marxist-Leninist political party, and it's called the Chinese Communist Party. They're very brutally realist about China's national security interests. Number one, what they want is a benign border with the Russian Federation. It's one of their longest land borders. And for most of the history of the China-Russia relationship, it's been adversarial. Right now, under Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin, it's not. In fact, it's getting a lot better. So that is strategic interest number one for Beijing. Keep a good relationship with Moscow under any circumstances. Because number two, that allows you as China to dedicate all your strategic enemies and energies to your strategic competition with the United States, regionally and globally. And on top of that, uh, Russia strategically distracts America and other theatres, whether it's the Middle East, North Africa, and as we see in Ukraine. And Russia also has a supply of enormous oil, gas, wheat, agricultural commodities to China as well. Put that together, when Xi Jinping looks at Ukraine, he says, that's pretty ugly, but in their overall scale of Chinese national interests, I do not see any scenario where they're going to really back away from Vladimir Putin. That is all very interesting. Thank you so much. Hopefully there, there is no escalation between the U.S. and China and, of course, the conflict in Ukraine. Hopefully that comes to an end very, very soon. But, Prime Minister, thank you so much for your time and thank you again for my very own copy. I appreciate it. Good to be with you, Stephanie. And still to come, meet the little girl helping to raise money for the victims of war, one cup of lemonade at a time. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos, the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24 Seven. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. She was diva, drama, money and fame, shop amazing, the prime housewife. Then suddenly, we've seen a lot of things on The Real Housewives, but we've never seen anyone be arrested. Unpredictable rich woman. Sign me up. Money. Ready for a little GMA ish promo? Okay, here we go. GMA 7A every day with Robin, George, and Michael. That's how you start the day. Boom! America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. 
the world is coming together to help support the people of Ukraine. And one little girl in Maine who is doing her part, and we're, it's our local partners are going to introduce us to, to her right now. She's doing her part with pictures of lemonade and homemade bracelets. In tonight's local lowdown, we go to Kennebunk, Maine, to meet this eight-year-old little girl who is getting to work. Reporter James Corrigan with our partner station WMTW has the story. Making bracelets is not uncommon for eight-year-old girls, but it's something else to make them for a cause. Why did you make that bracelet? Well, because I wanted to support Ukraine. Mackenzie Clancy learned about the war in Ukraine through watching the news with her parents. She started asking more in-depth questions about it that were really, you know, child-focused. You know, why, why were they running and what was happening? I heard what was happening, and the least I could do was support them. And support them she did through a lemonade stand yesterday in Kennebunk, selling cookies, bracelets, and keychains, all to raise money for Ukraine. She was in charge of, she did the signs and the bracelets and everything she was selling. I wanted to send a lot of money, but I didn't think that that many people would come. But come they did, helping Mackenzie raise nearly $600 to send a World Central Kitchen, but while she was surprised, her mom was less so. She's always been kind of a very empathetic little girl. I was more surprised that she had such a, a concrete, doable way to help. It's easy to get overwhelmed by big problems, but if you have a lot of people doing something small, then that becomes just as big as the problem itself. And for Mackenzie, she's already thinking about doing it again. Is this something you are going to want to do again? Yeah. Pitching in for a cause with pictures and bracelets. Already a good citizen in her community. Great job. That is our show for tonight. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Stephanie Ramos. Thanks for streaming with us. America's number one news, ABC.